So you've noticed that we are skipping chapter 17 about viruses. We'll add that in right before we do immunology. And we're going to jump over to chapter 18, which is a hodgepodge of um, slightly somewhat connected ideas about genomes and perhaps the evolution of the genomes. Um, so let's jump right in. And the picture in the beginning of the chapter is a great one to remind us that um, as far as we can tell, the major difference between these two species here, looking at the leaf, is the fact that the little um, freckled boy has the ability to speak about it. There's other cognitive things about it, but that's the real obvious one. Our brains evolve slightly differently, but we are um, pretty darn close in the amount of DNA that we have shared together. So the genome sequencing and the study of genomes um, allows us to compare genes and see how related we are to other species and start to get some ideas um, about how different genes evolved and changed to become what we are. Um, so I talk about gene se or the genome sequencing. Um, the project was undertaken in the 90s, officially completed in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and continues to be refined. The major um, procedure to do it was called shotgun cloning, where basically they chopped up a chromosome they sequenced each fragment and hoped that when they chopped it up there were overlaps. Um, the, basically the technology that allowed this to make genome sequencing go at all and now today go faster than we ever imagined it could is the idea that we have computers that can handle um, aligning these various sequences of DNA. So if you can see here if you sequence these chunks um, if you have enough overlap, you can then have computers find that overlap and put these in contiguous sequences. And that's exactly how they managed to paste together our chromosomes sequences. Um, knowing that, we can do a ton of stuff. This is just an example. We'll dive into this in the evolution unit. We'll actually do a um, blast search and comparison between some different species to show relatedness. Um, but there are huge databases that not only have the whole genomes that have been sequenced for um, different mammals, different plants, different single-celled organisms and bacteria, um, but also just genes that people have been working on along the way. So we do have huge databases where um, we can then go to computers that are off-site and ask them to compare things for us and spit out interesting comparisons. And we'll, we'll do some work with that, um, not only at the end of this chapter, but also in the next unit that we do. Um, I think that's enough to be said about this at this point. We'll do more. Other things you can do once you have a whole genome and refining the genomes is that you can make um, gene chips. You can see this is a gene chip that says it has human genome number, this one here. And it allows us to um, uh, do some expression analysis. We touched on it very slightly in um, chapter 16. And again, you really have to take a biotech class to get into the details of this. Maybe one day some of you guys will be working in labs where you're studying expression of different genes and, and seeing where they are in the human genome and how that relates to understanding how those proteins work. That would be the next step that has to happen after genome sequencing now. It's called studying the proteome, proteome and that's a whole other wing of research. So after they sequenced the human genome, um, there were some surprises. Um, a major surprise is that we only have exons to code for um, about 21,000 genes, they think it is now. One time the number went down as low as 19,000, now they got back up to 21,000. Um, we have over 100,000 different unique proteins that we've been able to um, study and think about or stu understand. Oh, my telephone is ringing. Hey, I think we're back. Are we back? I don't think so. Are we back? We're back. I'm going to assume we're back. Uh, sorry about that. The phone rang. What can you do? Um, so we're going to go back to presentation mode. We're talking about the hu huge, the whole genome that has been understood because we've done sequencing. Um, let me see if I can get that. There we go. Um, so we were surprised that exons were only a tiny amount of the genome. Since we are so focused on what proteins do, we would think that they're pretty important. Um, then their regulatory sequences associated with exons take up another chunk, actually a larger chunk than even the exons, amazingly. Introns, pretty large chunk, 20%. We've discussed that we have some ideas on what they might do, and we have still lots of unknowns of what introns might do. We just know that they are um, required for expression of many of the genes. Um, I'm going to jump over to ALU elements, which yeah, maybe I'll jump over to this one actually here. Um, repetitive DNA, 
unrelated to transposable elements. We're going to talk about what transposons on in a, in a minute, so I'm not going to get into that. They're a very specific kind of DNA that moves around in the genome. But repetitive DNA are basically either short sequences of DNA, maybe only five nucleotides long that show up in repeats, or even some longer ones. Um, again, not quite sure what they do. We do know in the case of telomeres, those short repeats are important to protect the ends of the chromosomes, and they would fall in this case. Um, but then there's other ones. They seem to be leftovers from the evolution of the genome. Again, still trying to figure out what they do. Um, there are ones that are large segment duplications. Again, repetitive elements, but they seem to show up many times in the genome. Again, still figuring out what those do. And then um, ALU elements are interesting. Um, they exist in 10% of the genome. They seem to be a specialized kind of leftover transposon that doesn't move around too much anymore, but it exists there. Um, all people have them, and we have some different versions of them. Um, then we have these ones that I've been alluding to, these repetitive DNA that includes transposons. Um, transposons are movable elements. They could be elements that are surrounding genes that are no longer expressed, things called pseudogenes. Maybe they've moved around and been disrupted that they don't have a promoter that works anymore. Um, maybe they have a chunk of their gene missing that they're not made anymore. They've found that some of these uh, sequences actually are important for expression of this guy. Basically, any exception to the rule you could find exists in the genome. Our genome is basically a culmination of a long time of evolution. Um, viruses are hiding out in our genome that we wouldn't have expected, and um, everything has evolved to be who we are. I don't expect you to memorize all of these. I'd like you to be aware of it and aware of the complexity of the genome and basically maybe be excited that there's something to study when you guys go off to grad school. Barbara McClintock did her work in the middle of the 1900s, um, 1940s, 50s, 60s, and she continued to keep working in the 80s and 90s. Um, she um, was very meticulous. She studied um, corn or maize, and she studied color that changed in those corn kernels, and she discovered what we now know are called transposons, or these movable elements in DNA. We've always been thinking about, and actually she was coming of age and doing her science at a time where we thought DNA was that master material, that blueprint. Why would we ever want anything moving around in it? She actually was not believed or taken seriously for a period of time, and it was only until they proved these sequences in bacteria and found that it's the exact same mechanism or very similar mechanism having it happening in um, higher eukaryotic organisms that um, she was really given the credit that she was due. Here's this transposon we've been talking about. It. Basically, a transposon, very simply um, named, is movable DNA. It transposes its location. So, very simply, a transposon is a piece of DNA that becomes mobile for some reason and then inserts somewhere else. You can imagine this could be awful for a genome. What if it jumps in in the middle of a gene? It might disrupt that gene and make it useless. What if it takes a long or it disrupts um, the control sequence in a gene like the promoter enhancer region now maybe you're not going to make a gene and that's exactly what it might be there for um, you could think of a transposon as the way to create variation in the genome the way to move um, if, if two transposons they don't have it in these pictures but if a transposon flanks the gene goes on either side of maybe an important gene, you might be able to move a gene in front of a different promoter and get to expression changed. You might have a transposon that flanks a control sequence, enhance a region, and now add that to a new gene and have it controlled differently. We'll get back to these kind of ideas when we talk about evolution and how we generate change in the genome and variation in the genome. Retro transposons are interesting to talk about here. Basically, they pop out, they get copied into RNA, and this is where we discovered that the human genome actually codes for and has its own reverse transcriptase, the ability to go backwards, to go from RNA to DNA. So we do have reverse transcriptase. Sometimes in a retro transposon, it's actually encoded in that transposon to make reverse transcriptase, to copy itself, to make a new copy of itself, and then go insert somewhere else. Um, previously, it was thought that you only had reverse transcriptase and viruses that came in, but apparently we still have it. I mentioned before that they think that parts of our genome are remnants of uh, viruses, and that probably is where we got that from.
Um, the next section in the book talks about just kind of moving on and discussing the genome, that there are gene families. So it turns out that the um, ribosomal RNA is a gene family. It exists in this little unit that's controlled in the DNA to make the different parts of the ribosome. And uh, it has a unique structure in, it, in the genome compared to other genes. Other way, other interesting things that have evolved in our genome, we'll come back to a figure about this too, are gene families. So hemoglobin, we know how critical that is to life. It carries our oxygen. There's the alpha globin and the beta globin components to hemoglobin. You can see there are four, two of each in the hemoglobin. Um, they exist on two different chromosomes, and um, there's all different variants that appear to be produced at different stages of development adult versus fetus versus embryo, and they are literally duplications um, and enhancements of a gene that probably arose originally and then changed. So again, we're just kind of delving into unique things about the genome um, and how it's all packaged in there. Interestingly, once we did some um, the sequencing of entire genomes, for example, human and chimpanzee, we can now compare those genomes and um, we can see where um, some of the human chromosomes came from. Basically, the chimpanzees have an extra chromosome than we, than we do, and it turns out that our chromosome number two is very long, and it's labeled two because it's the second longest chromosome we have, um, is actually a fusion of chimpanzee chromosome 12 and 13, um, and they know that by looking at the unique sequences that exist in those uh, chromosomes. So that's kind of interesting. We probably evolved after chimps, and um, when we evolved, we are a product of this fusion, which probably changed expression of genes that make us human. Similarly, we are pretty similar to mice. Um, they are a further ancestor to us than chimps are, but when you look again and you compare the chromosomes, it turns out the human chromosome 16 appears to be a compilation and mixing and matching of these four chromosomes in mice. This is the kind of stuff that scientists can do now that we've sequenced the, all the genomes, and hopefully we'll learn some interesting things about where we evolved from. This just shows you how um, these kind of evolution of chromosomes may have happened. Again, I don't want to go into the details of this. I'd just like you to be aware that um, we can have crossing over mistakes where chromosomes get kind of mix and match together. I think it's more interesting to think about how those globin genes may have evolved. So once upon a time, there was an ancestral globin gene, and something happened that it got duplicated. Maybe a transposon dragged a copy of it over to another location, and it separated into the alpha and the beta transcripts. Along that time, maybe a couple of mutations take place in the amino acids, and voila, you have two totally different variants of the globin gene. And then more change is going to happen. Maybe you have more... Uh, transposon events happen, more duplications and mutations take place, and the next thing you know, in adult, uh, typical humans today, we have all these different chromosomes that are genes that exist on two different chromosomes. Similarly, we know that we've evolved more unique and complicated proteins because of exon shuffling that happens in the, uh, D at the DNA level. So what this figure is showing you is how we might have gotten to this um, TPA gene, which is um, trypsin plasminogen activator gene. This is an enzyme that actually, um, it's called the clot busting gene. It breaks up blood clots, very important for somebody who has a stroke. We'll talk about that another time. But they found these domains or these exons that are come from literally cut and pasted from different other genes to make this final gene. So epidermal growth factor is just that. It's a growth factor. One of those got inserted. This fibronectin finger exon gets inserted. The finger refers to the way the protein folds. And then this Kringle exon, again, it's a name of a, a shape, Kringle. Um, I'll show you the picture of a Kringle, Kringle one day. Um, it's a Danish pastry. Um, famous from my town in Wisconsin that I'm familiar with. It's pretty tasty stuff. Anyway, these different domains get cut and pasted together, and voila, now we have a new gene totally um, reusing different pieces from other genes. So they think that's the way our genome probably evolved. I showed you the picture before of um, the mouse chromosomes changing to become human. So the mouse and um, the ancestor to the chimps and the humans shared a common ancestor over 60 million years ago. And then uh, more recently, we split from the, the chimps, our recent ancestor with them is about 5 million years ago. And we will be discussing that when we get into evolution. The last topic in this chapter that I want you to think about, and this is probably the one that's 
going to come up the most as far as the AP exam comes, is the idea of the Hox gene or the homeobox. So the homeobox genes are, again, related to each other because they share a domain. And that domain they share is um, a 30 amino acid stretch of um, amino acids that can bind DNA. So basically it's a DNA binding motif. Um, it's found as far back as flies and we know that the Hox genes in there behave as transcription factors to help set up the body plan. They help decide where the appendages should go and where the different um, the head and the thorax and the tail should be. Interestingly the same set of genes is expressed along the back of a mouse and they also are expressed along the um, back of a human, uh, the partitioning of the somites or the spinal column of the human. Again, these are pattern formation genes. They help establish the body plan. And the things that they share are these sequences here, just they show up by the color coding in the chromosome, that they are sequences that bind DNA. So the Hox gene service transcription factors. They're a great example of a gene that has been conserved throughout evolution. It probably evolved once and then variants of it that have moved around genomes because of tra uh, transposons or mutations or fusions of chromosomes um, exist now in higher organisms all the way up to humans. And I believe I'm going to stop the discussion with that. There's more in the chapter, but this is more than enough for us to cover in this part.